we're, you know, playing a six nighter in Kappa Skating, and then next thing, you know, six months later, a record comes out and it explodes. And uh, we're on a tour bus going across America, opening for Jeff Motol of all bands. Hey, Derry, how's it going? It's Brandon calling from the Singles of Intuition. Hey, Brandon. Uh, where are you? I'm uh, located in Windsor. Oh, okay. We were just there. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw you guys on, uh, I think it was Thursday night last week. Oh, you were there. Yeah. Cool. G- great show. Thank you. Um, so when I do these, I like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to the new record. Um, so starting from the beginning, where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? I grew up in St. Catharines, Ontario. Okay. Oh, so where the band is from. Yeah, which is close to Niagara Falls. That's where I, I was born. I, I grew up there. Started on piano when I was five because my dad was a, he was a doctor, but he also had a big grand piano in the house and he was a classical piano player too. So that's kind of where I first heard all that music. So I started piano at five and then I switched to guitar at 11. This is what you want to know, a little brief history. Yeah, of course. I, I love to hear people's early history. I'm a fellow guitar player. So, I mean, I love hearing how people got into it, what influenced you, all that sort of stuff, right? Right. Okay. So piano, yes. You know, piano lessons for all the kids. Hated it at first, but it was good because I learned to read music. And then as I got a little older, around 11, I realized piano just wasn't as cool as guitar because I heard, you know, smoke on the water and I started to get into rock and I really wanted to play guitar. So I, as long as I kept up my piano lessons, uh, my father let me you know, take some guitar lessons. And uh, it was game over, you know, once I got a, a guitar and started learning some stuff. And on and on it went, you know, into high school and into electric guitar and just got into rock. I wanted to, I love Richie Blackmore. I wanted to play rock and roll guitar. So through high school, with some uh, high school bands, you know, and then um, a couple of smaller bands in my hometown. And after high school, I went to uh, Fanshawe College in London to the uh, recording arts program they have there. Oh, that's so funny. I actually got accepted into that. I didn't end up going there, but um, I had a lot of friends who went. And actually, funny enough, I just spoke to Harry Hess from Harem Scarum not that long ago, and he also went there. Yeah, that's right, Harry. And uh, that's where I met Dave Betts, our drummer. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, so you guys both met at Fanshawe. That's so funny. Yeah, that's where we first met. And uh, we got in a a new wave band called Steve Blimke and the Reason as a college project and played. This is back in the new wave days, you know, early 80s, late 70s. And we did a couple of records with him, the quirky new wave guy. And then that was over. And Dave and I, after college, moved up to Toronto and started looking for gigs. And I was looking around for a gig, in and out of this and that, just trying to find another band to play with. That's when I met Johnny D through our booking agent, who booked us in separate bands. But Johnny had started Honeymoon Suite already. And I called him up and I asked him if he had any bands, need guitar player. He said, well, I got this kid, this Johnny kid from Niagara Falls, just started a band called Honeymoon Suite. And um, his guitar player just quit. So why don't you go and meet him and audition? So I did. And uh, we hit it off. And um first little while we we're just a cover band just so we could eat you know go up northern ontario and play six nighters playing billy idol and flock of seagulls and genesis all that stuff and um at the same time sneaking in uh new girl now you know i had a few songs that i wrote at college and i played johnny new girl now and a few others and he loved them so we would sneak the originals in and then at some point we did a demo of new girl now and sent it into q107 uh, in toronto for their homegrown and uh, it ended up winning that year and getting lots of airplay. The label started to come out and see us at gigs. And long story short, we got signed to WIA in Canada. Tell me about that first version of New Girl now. I've heard it. It's, uh, I mean, it's still obviously the same song, but quite a bit different from the recorded version everybody knows now. Tell me about recording that one. The demo. Yeah, we were playing like uh, doing another six-nighter probably in like Elliott Lake, Ontario or something. We'd finish on a Saturday night and Steve, our uh, our manager at the time, said, you guys got to get, I got a producer for you, Tom Tremuth. He's got a studio in his house because we were trying to get a record deal. So we would take any days off just to write and record. So we drove all night. We got to his place in the morning, Tom's place, and we went down his basement and we cut three songs. One of them was New Girl Now. I think we did Funny Business and another one just on an eight track. 
The original lyric was uh, Cold Winter Night, Storm Clouds in the Air. That's what I originally wrote. So that's how we demoed it. That's funny. So it, it was that experience that led you then to get him to produce the first record then, eh? Yeah, because our manager, Steve, had been talking to Tom, who'd done some other bands around Toronto, and he was interested in maybe producing our record. So that's what happened. After we got his nine, they decided to let Tom produce the record as well yeah i know like later he would go on to do helix and a whole bunch of other yeah. major bands i know yeah. how was a you guys worked a bit with garth richardson on that record as well eh garth we've known garth from college he went to fanshawe too oh that's so funny and um all the same class there yeah he knew dave a little better than me because they're both from toronto and garth was geez i i guess he was in and out of the studio doing stuff he probably worked on it but the funny thing is his dad, Jack, um, when I was a kid in St. Catharines, I was in another local band. And we actually, uh, uh, the little manager we had at the time, he got us a recording session at Nimbus 9, Jack's old studio. Oh, really? And, wow. Yes, he had some connections. We went into Nimbus 9 and recorded our crappy little demo. And Jack Richardson was there and he heard our songs and we, we, we got to meet him. Who's uh, Mike McCarty was the engineer. So that's when I first met Jack, long time before I met Garth. And then years later, I met Garth. And we've been good friends with Garth, and he's gone on to be a big producer as well. So that's my Jack Richardson story. And um, yeah, cut the first record at phase one. Which is funny. I was actually, I was in there, uh, I think it was about two days before they closed in 2017, friend of mine was having a session and he said oh just come on by and hang out so you know you walk in and it's like oh my god the gold records are overwhelming in that place really that was back when i'm sure like that was like the studio back then eh? yeah yeah it was pretty big everybody was recording there was a it was a big studio yeah a lot of records coming out of there when paul gross was running it we went in there sixty thousand dollar budget cut the record in about two weeks and uh wow you know done quickly but we had it together because we were a we were a live band, you know, back in those days. You had to be a band, and we played six nights a week. So we were tighter than shit, and we went in there, we knew the songs. So we, we recorded fast, and uh, it sounded really, you know, for a first album, it's got a great energy, and it did really well. Oh, yeah. Oh, tremendous. I mean, you look at, I mean, I think the first four songs on that record are all hits. Crazy. I know. Four singles and videos. You remember, we came at a really good time because videos were just starting then. Much music had just started up in MTV, and that was the thing. The video it just skyrocketed bands up to uh, you know a level when you had a video out. Much music was slamming it, and it was on MTV. It really, it really pushed you up there pretty quickly. Um, the sales and everything else. So it was a great time to be in a band. Who did uh, who did you guys tour with on that record? The, <laughs> the first um, the first album, our first. Big tour was opening for Jethro Tull in America. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were, you know, playing Kappa, a six-nighter in Kappa Skating six months earlier. And then next thing, you know, six months later, a record comes out and it explodes. And uh, we're on a tour bus going across America opening for Jethro Tull, of all bands. Go figure. How was the <laughs> audience towards you guys for that tour? Because that's quite the difference in sound between the two bands. I know. I know we were a little apprehensive, a little scared, you know, because it couldn't be more different. But they're actually pretty receptive. Nobody threw stuff. And uh, I think we did a, a good job. I think they tolerated us. That's fantastic. Well, especially like you say, with you guys being working musicians and, you know, you woodshedded all that time going and banging out all those nights in front of audiences. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to move up to a bigger stage at that point. So one album that I played to death as a kid, and I'm sure so many others did, was the next album, The Big Prize. And for that record, you got to work with, I mean, among the biggest names in Canadian recording, Bob Rock and Bruce Fairburn. How was it working with the two of them? Oh, it was amazing, man. Um, Bruce and I got along really well. He's very level-headed, very a chill guy. But he came from a band, you know, he came from prison. He came as you started out as a musician. And he was a songsmith, and he was really about the songs. Before you do any recording, get your songs together. He had a very great method to him. He was real nice and, and chill, but at the same time, he had a schedule. He was a schedule guy. 
he didn't screw around with bands like that. So we're doing solos these two days and then they're going to be done because we got a, a timeline. And that's the way I like it is, is having a schedule because then it gets done. And of course, at that time, Bob Rock was his head engineer. Bob hadn't started producing yet. So being a guitar player, Bob was a guitar player in the Paolas. So he had all his guitars and his amps and stuff at Little Mountain. So him and I got along great because those he got me those great guitar sounds on the big prize. That's a lot of the, a lot of that is his gear, and he knew his studio. He knew how to mic it up and get great sounds. So that was a definite bonus for me. It's amazing. Now it's my understanding that Bon Jovi loved that record, and that inspired them to work with that team. Is that true? Um, yeah, apparently that's the story. I mean, as Bob tells it, you know, I watched the documentary the other day, and Bob was talking about that. When Bon Jovi was looking for a producer, they had uh, Richie had said that they heard the Honeymoon Suite album and it was done in Vancouver with Bruce Fairburn. And that was the reason that they went up there because they loved the sound of that record. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's funny because as a kid, like the first time I heard Wounded, it was before I really knew who you guys were. And my first thought was, wow, that sounds like Bon Jovi. And that led me to seek it out, which honestly blew my mind to hear that song to hear you guys play it the other night i thought that was really cool that I, I don't know if that was a hit or not from that record but obviously you think of feel it again or something right so yeah that was a nice surprise in the set to get to hear well, that one it's funny that we had that song you know wounded shot through the heart you just can't be the same and then the next thing you know bon jovi is like shot through the heart and you're you know yeah. <laughs> you know i think they they plucked a few lines off of that. I'm sure it has some influence in them, but they had a much bigger hit, of course. But yeah. Oh, that's mm-hmm. so funny. Uh, the next record, Racing After Midnight. So again, recording with rock royalty, Ted Templeman, again, working with Garth and Toby Wright, who would later go on to be a massive producer and engineer in his own right. Yeah, Toby. So you guys did that one in Hollywood at One on One, eh? Yeah, we came up, you know, that during that time you would come be in studios where, you know, the tape op would be some guy you didn't know. And then 10 years later, he's a super producer. That's just the way it went. We, we came, we met, we worked with a lot of cool people that ended up doing big things. After the big prize did so well, we, of course, had to get back in the studio. And at that point, Bruce Fairburn was, he'd already done a Slippery with Bon Jovi. And we would have had probably wait two years now to get with him again because he was now a super producer. And I really wanted him to do the third record, but time wise, it would do, you know, the label didn't want us to wait that long because of the momentum. So because we were on Warner Brothers in LA, uh, Ted was the head of AR there. And uh, we did the, um, they called us down. Um, at first, we just went down there to demo Lethal Weapon because uh, this movie was coming out and Ted kind of liked our band and they needed a, uh, a band to record the lead track. So they brought us to LA and gave us the cassette of Lethal Weapon and Ted produced it. And that's when we first worked with him and met him. And then we got to talking about doing an album and it kind of morphed into Ted producing our third album, which is super cool for me because you know I'm a Van Halen fan and Montrose and Doobies and all that. I, couldn't believe I was working with the guy. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Montrose because that was the album that got me into rock and metal and everything else. How did the Lethal Weapon thing come about initially? Like, how did you guys get picked out to play on that track? Well, we were doing, we were on WIA in Canada, but Warner Brothers in the States. And um, we were doing a lot of work through the States. We did a lot of stuff in LA. We'd go down there for shows and interviews and stuff so we're spending a lot of time there and um the movie i guess ted got the cassette on his desk the lethal weapon movie was finished done but they didn't have the title track recorded yet and michael came and wrote the song and ted was looking for a band i guess to they were kind of in a rush they need a a band somebody to sing this song so they get it in the movie and i guess maybe we were just sitting in his office at the time or our manager got talking you know how these things happen it's like hey not even sweets in town or i can get get them down here see if they like it it's kind of don't know exactly how it happened but i know that michael came and did a cassette with just him and a piano and it was pretty rough and johnny hated it at the beginning you know because it was just such a cheesy demo to him but ted is like come on johnny just try it 
So we went into the studio uh, with all of this and, and cut it, and Johnny did an amazing vocal. So that's where it started. That's unreal. Just start with a little piano song, and it's like next thing you know, you beef it up and it turns into that huge track, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me this now. So, you know, I obviously just saw you guys with Men Without Hats and Spoons. And from that record, you guys had uh, Rob Proust join you from Spoons on that record. Uh, had you known Spoons for a long time at that point? Or how did he come to join the band? Um, well, Ray Coburn quit at the worst time. You know, the big prize is was such an amazing sounding album. Ray, Ray was such a big part of the sound on that record. He did amazing keyboard parts. And then he decides, you know, that he doesn't, he's not happy anymore. He wants to leave the band and go out and do his own thing, which is probably the worst thing he could have done. And uh, he decides to leave. So we had to get somebody and quick. So we auditioned a whole bunch of guys in Toronto. And uh, Rob was one of the guys that came in. He kind of you know, had a good look and he, he was a talented guy and he wasn't with the spoons anymore. And he kind of fit the bill. So Ray was out and Rob was in. That's awesome. Was he with them on uh, the other night or no? no? He's not in the band anymore, eh? No, no. Rob, is, Rob has li- been in New York uh, for many, many years. He lives in New York City and he's been doing the, a lot of Broadway stuff, musicals, uh, being like a music director. Oh, okay. In On Broadway, like doing really well mm-hmm. for himself. And that's been his main gig for many years uh, in New York City. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's incredible. So Monsters Under the Bed. So I've also interviewed Paul Northfield, and I believe he told his side of the story for Monsters. I mean, he's done a million records, so I honestly, I can't remember if we talked about it. But I'm curious, how was it working with him in St. Anne de Lac in uh, Quebec? Yeah. You talked to Paul Northfield recently? Uh, oh, God, it was probably 10 years ago now. It's been a while. Oh, I wonder what happened to him. Um, I haven't talked to her from, since, since the record, but... That was a different album for us because after that was early nineties, that was our last album for Warner and the whole thing just changed. You know, when the nineties came in and grunge came in, starting to come in, Dave and Gary had left the band. Things were kind of falling apart a little bit, but Johnny and I kept it going and uh, Ray was came back. So there's the three of us wanting to do our last album for Warner. And we got a, uh, you know, session players to play drums and bass. Uh, there's some, Great songs in that record, but it wasn't your classic honeymoon sweet pop record. I think the subject matter was a little deeper. The playing was a lot more intricate. It's a great record, but it's different. So we recorded at Le Studio up in uh, Quebec. Oh, that was at Le Studio. Mm -hmm. And it was cool because I knew I'm a huge Rush fan and I knew they did moving pictures there and I'm in the same studio. So it was a lot of fun. We went up there and you're out in the country just you're living up there, you know, it's a great vibe. So pretty happy. You know, I'm proud of the record. And uh, that was our last one for Warner. Yeah, that record, it really did turn out amazing. And I will say it was it was definitely like you say, it's definitely more intricate. It was definitely a grower after being used to the first three. But honestly, it's besides still the big prize It's probably the one I reach for the most, just because it has those layers and, yeah. you know, subtext to the songs and things where you can really put it on and go okay there's something to really appreciate here well each album you do is kind of a snapshot in time a little piece of part of the history of the band and that's where we were at that point things were changing guys had left and then it was just crazy music business stuff you know but we soldiered on and that's that's what we came up with there i think we worked really hard on it um it's amazing playing and sounds on it so that's what came out of that little period there. Yeah. I got to say, it was really cool to hear uh, Say You Don't Know Me as well in the set. I thought that was uh, a really nice, I, I don't know if that was it, because I think that was a single from that record, if I'm not mistaken. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. That was that was a single. Record did okay, but not great because I think, again, the music, the business was changing. You know, Once grunge came in, uh, a lot of labels just shut down the melodic rock 80s stuff just wasn't relative anymore and they switched their attention to nirvana and alice and chains that's where it was going and it really hurt a lot of our our type of bands so that's the business though changes oh for sure 
Uh, now tell me, so there's 10 years between records. I know you guys still, you guys were still sort of together and did shows and stuff, but I think the band, you guys sort of went into hibernation mode for a little bit during the two records in the 90s. Yeah, well, the 90s was tough. In early 2000s, we did a few independent records like Lemon Tongue and Dreamland, did a live album. And it was really, at one point, it was just down to Johnny and I soldiering on. And I think one year we, we didn't, we played one show. The whole year we had one gig. That's how sparse it was. The demand just wasn't there anymore. It was a rough time, man. But we kept on. <laughs> really was. I lived through it. I'm like, what the hell happened yeah. to music? <laughs> and we had different guys come in, different drummers, different bass players. But that's that's what you do, you know. You just you push on. And then uh, started, you know, the 2000s. I don't know at what point I said to Johnny, I really miss Dave and Gary and why don't we see if they're, you know, they left the band for like 10, 15 years. I just called them up. So you guys want to come back and rehearse, see if we, uh, if we sound good. Cause I want to go back out. I, I miss the band. I miss you guys. Cause we're still friends. And they came back and we started to rebuild the band. Peter Nunn at that point was our keyboard player and still is. And Peter's been in the band longer than anybody, the other keyboard player. So he's, he's basically a member of the band, and that's the way it's been for many years now, is Peter, Dave, and Gary are in the band, and it's better than ever. And we've rebuilt it, and it keeps getting better every year. And here we are with the new album, and it's things are really good. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. So about, uh, just stepping back in time to Lemon Tongue, um, from what I know, like, I haven't, I I have Lemon Tongue, but I haven't heard Dreamland. But from what I know, it's basically the same record. It is because or kind of the same record. Yeah, it is. It's a bit of a mix, a mashup, because we were working with Frontiers for a few albums. Frontiers uh, is a label in Italy, and they would put uh, stuff out in Europe for us. I think Dreamland was kind of their idea. They wanted the songs of Lemon Tongue, but they also wanted some other tracks that we have. I can't really remember, but it was kind of put together with different tracks that they're the release that they put out over there you're right yeah i know for that record you guys had uh it's funny like i feel like a lot of the people who've come through your band are you, you guys seem very related to kim mitchell which is kind of funny you know it's it's like um you know i know i know ray played with kim for a while randy cook on drums played with kim rob laidlaw played with kim yeah tell me about working with randy and rob on that record well yeah i mean everybody knows everybody in canada we're, we're all friends and we've all played together played with each other here and there everybody's played with everybody you're right because there's not that many high profile gigs in canada and there's only a handful of guys that do them but Playing with uh, Randy Cook, well, you know, Randy's killer drummer. I mean, at one point we were doing demos and Randy came in and uh, Laidlaw was kicking around. Uh, he wanted to do an album and uh, yeah, it was great. You know, Rob's a great player, great singer. And uh, he came in, we did some writing and then Randy just came in and cut some drums for us. What can I say? You know, guy was great. So about, I think it was about six, seven years ago now, you guys did uh, the Hands Up EP, which in a way, this new record sort of feels like a continuation of that. I mean, I, I guess since um, Clifton Hill as well, but I feel especially Hands Up sort of, you know, that EP and this album tend to go really well together as far as the sound and uh, the vibe of it. Tell me about working with Sean Kelly. Um, and having him uh, write, and I think he produced it, if I'm not mistaken. Well, no, I, well, we produced, I think, uh, no, he didn't produce it. I don't think so, but um, we did some writing. Yeah, Sean's an old friend of mine, for sure. He's worked with everybody. He's a great guy. Sean, you know, just, uh, he was somebody who hooked us up with um, the studio we were working at in, the, in Toronto. Uh, Lanny, Rob Lanny's place, I forget what it's called, but it's in an old church or something. And uh, we cut some stuff there. A lot of it was done in home studios. But yes, Sean was involved in the writing process early on and, and was a co-writer of some of the songs. And then I wrote a few, Johnny wrote a few. And it was just, it was fun. It's always good for us to, to get a record done and low budget, just because every once in a while we come up with songs and fans want it. So I'm just driven to cut records. Whether I mean, you're not going to sell a lot, but we did it, and uh, 
one that's what led us to where we are now. This new one just blows them out of the water. I mean, production wise, the production of this new one is way bigger and way better. Just the people involved are pretty happy with it. Yeah, I was going to say, well, tell me about working with Mike Krampus. I mean, again, you know, super producers. There's Mike. I mean, the sound of the record sounds incredible. Tell me about working with him as a producer and sort of what he brought to this new album. Mike, I got hooked up with Mike through my daughter, Leah Marlene, who's a singer. Um, she was on The Voice, wasn't she? American Idol. American Idol, that's it. She finished uh, top three um, two seasons ago. So that just, that really helped her career big time. And um, we have been making trips down to Nashville. My wife and I bring in Leah down for writing and recording. And that's where I first met Mike because he, he was living there at the time. And I'd reached out to him to see if he would, um, if he would be interested in writing with Leah and maybe having her come to his studio. Because Mike was doing a lot of pop stuff. So we did. We went down and with Leah and we, we cut a couple of songs with Mike uh, producing Leah. And at that time, Mike had just started a label. And he was, he grew up listening to Honeymoon Suite. He was a fan. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Big fan of Honeymoon Suite. A little younger than us, but he knew all the stuff. So it was a natural progression. Mike said he'd love to produce an album for us. He knew what the band was about. He wouldn't change us. He, he knew what the Honeymoon Suite sound. So that's how that happened. We started the record in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where he was living at the time. And it went from there. Was it? Now, from what I know, the record was done over a couple of years, right? Like you guys put uh, Find What I'm Looking For. That song came out, what, two, three years ago now? It was done in um, kind of bits and pieces because I was living in Illinois. Johnny's still up in Canada. Mike's in Tennessee. So we would go back and forth and cut songs. Um, we'd write them and we just cut them right there. So we, a lot of bands now will release singles instead of albums. So we decided just to keep the momentum going. Tell Me What You Want was the first single we released, like right three years ago, and then Find What You're Looking For. So over those few years, while we were still making the record, we released a couple of singles. And uh, they did well. And uh, yeah, trying to finish the album. Then COVID hits. We're just about done the recording and, and the COVID thing happens. So everything shut down. That pushed things back for everybody. It was a tough time, especially in the music business. But we finally got it done after Mike decides to move to England right before COVID. Oh, geez. Yeah, he doesn't want to be in Tennessee anymore. He wants to go to the UK and build a studio, which is what he did. So now Johnny and I got to fly over there to finish our tracks. Crazy. This album has been done everywhere. But we did finally get it done. And uh, it's out. It was a lot of work for me. But I'm pretty happy it's finally it's done. Yeah. Well, I've got to say, I mean, you guys put forth a, a hell of a record. I mean, I think in some ways this might be... You know, it's certainly among your best. You guys have done, I don't know, eight records or something. So, I mean, I guess it only means so much. But, like, I've had it on for the last week or two. And, I mean, every single one of these songs, I hear the first notes and I can already hear the chorus <laughs> popping up in my head. So, I mean, you guys have done a tremendous job with coming up with some very catchy choruses and parts and things to the song. Yeah, thanks. Well, we wrote it. It's me and Johnny and Mike. The three of us kind of wrote it together, it was put our heads together and... Mike is great because he's a rock guy. He's an amazing guitar player and a drummer and all that. But he's also, um, he, he got the sound of our band and the songs, but it doesn't sound dated. His production, he kind of updated our sound and big drums, big guitar, but he's not making it something it's not. So it's a nice combination of the classic Honeymoon Suite, but more with updated, bigger production. Yeah, Mike's really good. Yeah, it's still very much the same sound. You could throw in Find What You're Looking For, Love Comes, or any of these other songs in between, you know, Feel It Again or New Girl Now or any of the other songs, right? And it would not be out of place in your set. No. The problem with, you know, earlier records like Clifton Hill and Hands Up, they were good records, but they're done not on big budgets and big studios. Um, they sound good, but Mike took it to a whole other level which is what I've been wanting to do for a long time. I miss the big drums, big guitar. Mike knew how to get those sounds. That's what we used to do in the past. So I'm very happy with the sound of yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's quite incredible. Now, are there any songs on the record that maybe have an interesting story behind them or any that especially mean something to you? Um, no, the songs, they all have little different stories to them. Some of the ideas, some of the riffs and stuff I've had kicking around for years, but they were just unfinished. And I brought them into the writing sessions and we found the right chorus. And then other songs are written really quickly, like Tell Me What You Want. were kind of written like right in the studio, spot, spontaneous. Everybody brought ideas in. Johnny brought his in and mine. And uh, it's a really, it's nice because it's a combination of all of us working together. And I think it makes it better. Stories about songs? Hmm, I don't know. That whole This whole album is a story, man. Like just the fact that we got it done and flying all over the place to do what we had to do in four or five different studios we, we were in. But I think it's cool when albums are done like that. They have a lot of flavors in them. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So, you know, the new record comes out February 16th. Is there anything else that we can plug from yourself? Any upcoming projects, any dates, anything like that? This time of year is when we start booking up the summer festival shows, getting ready for it. May, June, July, and all that stuff. So it's exciting. That's what we're doing now, planning up the summer, playing a few shows a month. And the only other thing, I actually, through COVID, because I spent so much time at home in my studio, just playing guitar all day because I wasn't touring, I started laying down a lot of riffs. And from that, I actually decided to do a solo album, just guitar, which I just finished mixing. So I'm going to put out a Derry Gray and solo record maybe in a few months. Um, it's all guitar, just kind of riff rock stuff. And it's really a lot of fun. I can't wait for people to hear it. Is it, uh, is it instrumental? It's instrumental. Yeah. No singing. All guitar, like, like a Joe Satriani type album, you know, just all guitar. And I've got, uh, also Godan guitars made a signature guitar for me last year. My time, my famous tire tread guitar from, Racing After Midnight. Yeah. So I don't have my own signature guitar. So a lot of cool things have happened in the last little while for me. And it's all just great for the band and great for me. And that's what I mean. Things are cooking along nicely. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Derry, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. All the great stories. Um, loving the new record. So I wish you guys all the best with that. I hope it blows up. Like I said, I've been listening to it for a week and absolutely loving it. So I oh, appreciate it. Thank ho- you. Hoping to catch you guys uh, out on the road soon. Loved the set uh, about a week ago. So hoping to catch you again. Cool. All right, Brandon. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Take it easy.